Hi, this is Jason Kendall, and welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. We're still talking about light. Light, what the heck is that stuff, light? Light is, well, the thing that we see things with. So we want to know exactly how light does what it does. Last time we reviewed the concept of the speed of light, we reviewed con the concept of Doppler shift, we reviewed the concept of what the electromagnetic spectrum is and how it varies with wavelength and what visible light is. We didn't say what it was and how it's created. It's kind of weird. We know that it has these wave properties and it acts like a wave, but what makes it act like a wave and exactly what is it? Well, to understand that, we need to know how light is created. So let's take an example. How does matter create light? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Let's start and go back and say, well, we've talked about uh, Maxwell's laws and the nature of electromagnetic interactions, but uh, we also talked about the nature of fundamental particles like electrons and protons. An electron and proton has a charge, like an electric charge. A proton is how that electric charge is distributed inside it. It has quarks inside it, but really from the outside far enough away, meaning about 10 to the minus 10th meters, it looks like a point charge with a plus sign, and that's pluses by convention. We just call it a plus. It could be a minus, it could be a plus. It doesn't really matter. It's just what we call it. Um, but then the electron has the exact opposite charge, the same exact amount, but exactly this different, exactly opposite um, uh, sign. So two like charges, plus plus, will repel each other, and two uh, opposite charges will attract each other. And that's the nature of it. But what do we mean by charges, and why do they retell each other, and what's going on? Well, let's think about this concept, an incredibly important concept to all of physics, and in fact, the incredibly important concept to the element of what we call electromagnetism, is the idea of an electric field. An electric field is the influence in space by an electric charge to everything around it. And it doesn't have a limit. It just keeps going. There's no limit. It's just its intensity drops off as the distance squared, but there's no real like limit where it says, well, now I'm done, and it stops, and it's the end of the line. So really, this picture of an atom that is out there, or a plus charge that sits there, and that plus charge just has these what we call field lines. And if you place something, say another plus charge, at a location on a field line, the total number or density of field lines at that location determines how much it's getting get pushed away. So the field says, give me a test charge, I'll tell you what force I'm going to exert on another get up due to the charge at the source. So I placed a little test charge at the at the source of the um, at, at the at the field line, and we can place another test test charge. Maybe one's plus, one's minus. But if it's plus, it gets pushed away, and if it's minus, it gets attracted towards it. So the field lines also determine the direction of motion that the test charge will go. And from a plus charge, we can think of it as being outbound. And a minus charge, it can be considered inbound. And by convention, it doesn't really matter what direction, but we can just do it that way. So a plus charge, if you place another plus charge on a field, in an electric field, next to a plus charge, and the test charge is very tiny, so incredibly tiny, or posited to be tiny, that it actually is the thing that's moved and not the source because we're pushing against it. Remember, Newton's equal and opposite forces. One of them just has to be a big enough charge that it doesn't get affected by the other charge as much. So the test charge can be infinitesimally small. And then it just gets rocketed out on those field lines and it goes very, very far away. But if you place it closer, then the field lines are denser and that means it gets a harder push. And if it's an electric, if it's a negative charge, then it'll be attracted in the same way. It'll be attracted not as much if it's far, and the closer you put it, the more attraction it shall be. So it gains energy as they fall towards each other because they're pulling on each other, and the closer they are, the, the harder they pull on each other because the force of attraction is increased as their as their distance uh, as their distance is is made small and the force of attraction or repulsion is decreased as they're farther and farther apart and so at some point they can be so far apart that uh, that the the electrostatic or the electrostatic or electromagnetic force between them um, the electric the electrostatic force between them can be minuscule and not taken into account however 
if you have loose charges around there, they really true. This the electric force is very strong and is going to really try to actually make it so that there's that the charges get neutral. In any event, opposites attract, like charges repel. And if you've got one, you got the other. So that's really what we're talking about. So plus charges repel against plus charges and minus charges repel against minus charges. Protons have a plus charge. Electrons have a negative charge. They have exactly the same amount of charge. They are just opposite and, and equal magnitude. The electron has a much smaller mass. The proton has a much larger mass than the electron. So the proton tends to stay still where the electron tends to whiz about. All right, so distant charges feel the effect of other charges. So all charges feel the effect of the other charges through the electric field that they generate. So really space is permeated by the electric field due to charges. And if they're all standing still, all these electric fields um, don't move. They're just kind of sitting there. If everybody's held in place, they're all pinned down. Let's say all the charges in the universe are pinned to one place, to wherever they're at, doesn't matter where they're at, they're just pinned. Then everything would be pushing on it, but then they're pinned down so they can't move, but they're pushing with the electric field or they're pulling depending on their charges and, or the, the signs of their charges and that tells us how they're gonna move. All right, now let's do something very strange. We then jiggle one of them. If we jiggle them, then the, then the field must change. And how does the field change? The field may change in a regular way. Let's say you instead somehow take an electron and put it between, let's say you staple it between two springs. And if it's between two springs, it might go up and down between the two springs, or it's stapled to between two boards on two springs, and so it can go up and down. And as long as you don't touch it, it's not gonna vibrate, just like anything that's held by two strings between two boards, right? But if you come along and flick it, then the electron will bounce up and down, right? Now, if the electron has an electric field that's associated with it, and the electric field is inbound, uh, by convention, and the field lines are drawing towards it, so let's use a proton, so it's outbound, like the outbound arrows. So a proton is staying put, and it's, staying, it's held between these two springs, between the two boards, and you kick it. Now it's going up and down. And if it's just going up and down, bouncing up and down like this, what do we notice? The field doesn't stay fixed in space. The field follows the proton. So the proton was here and the field radiates out from wherever the proton is at that moment. So then the way those some of the field lines aren't fixed in space. They're moving. They have to be moving up and down. Wait a second. If you make something move up and down, then you've got a wave. Now, what does the pro what happens to that? Well, then there's a disturbance in, or disturbance, or a, a wave motion of up and down of the proton. So now the electric field is going up and down. Now, how long does it take for something very far away, a distant charge, to feel it? Huh, well, those changes in the electric field propagate at a particular speed, the speed of light. So really, what is light? Light is a disturbance in the electric field of a charged particle that makes a disturbance. It vibrates, it moves, it accelerates, it changes. And as it changes, the electric field disturbs and that disturbance propagates along. That disturbance is called a photon. That's light. Light is that disturbance. Now, why doesn't it propagate forever like these, like these vibrating strings that we see or like you can pluck a string and have a standing wave? Well, Photons propagate from here to there in the same way that if you take a jump rope and you flick the jump rope, when you flick the jump rope, it bounces. And if, you, if the jump rope bounces, then you, you see the pulse go down the jump rope and the pulse comes back from the jump rope. Now you can make it so there's a nice regular pattern to it. You can do double dutch by having two of the jump ropes go around. You can make it have a nice even string where you have wave patterns in the rope. But really, if you flick the rope, then the disturbance goes down the rope and back the rope. And that disturbance in the electric field line, as it propagates due to the previous motion of the proton, is what the photon is. It's a disturbance in that electromagnetic field. That's really something. So a photon is a disturbed magnetic field that was disturbed, say, some time ago by a very distant thing. And then that distant thing, that propagation of that electric field from there to here gets to us eventually. Isn't that weird? 
if that's what light is, if that's what light is, and that's probably a very close analogy to what we call it from, uh, from, from, great, from deep studies of what the nature of space and time are, then light, then the, the, when you look at some distant galaxy, maybe millions of light years away, there was some electron that shook, just a tiny electron or a tiny proton, a very, very, very lightweight object shook, created a disturbance by its shaking that made a disturbance in its electric field. And that electric field disturbance propagated out through space on the electric field of the proton and eventually reached your eye three million light years away. Wow, that's interesting. So it propagates through space radiatively, carrying the energy of the disturbance that created it across space, vast areas of space, as a packet of, as a packet of a disturbance, as a wave packet, a disturbed wave packet in the electric field lines as it propagates through space. That's an interesting picture of a photon, and that's what we call that. So that packet of waves, that disturbance is called a photon. And electrons don't vibrate forever. Protons don't vibrate forever. They take a certain amount of time and then they stop vibrating. And when it's done vibrating, then guess what? That's the end of the wave packet train. And there it goes, the photon's on its way. All right, now uh, that's essentially a very meat and potatoes sort of elementary way of talking about photons. Photons have a certain amount of energy and the amount of energy is related to the frequency or the wavelength, whichever you'd like to use in order to say how much energy the photon has. So the wavelength of the photon determines its energy. The short wavelength photons have high energy. The long wavelength photons have low energy. Radio light has long wavelengths, so it's low energy. Gamma ray light has, high wave, has short wavelengths, so it has high energy. Um, next, because it's a wave motion, and if you do something really interesting, if you take because we, we learn this through electromagnetism. If you go take an electrostatics class, you learn about Faraday's law. You learn about the nature of, 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 the, of the Biot-Savart law. You learn all these interesting things where if you take a current, take a current of, of electrons, which is now an electric flow, a ch flow of charges in a circle, make a circular charge flow, you create a magnetic field. Hmm. A magnetic field flows through the charge. So if you want to start your car, you, go, you use what's called a solenoid. And a solenoid is a many, many, many turns of an electric coil. You then put a charge back and forth. You change an electric current back and forth through that solenoid, and it moves a piston that then, that then starts the engine running, and that, start, and that forces gasoline into the, into the engine and then starts the engine up. So you can take an electric force from the battery and do an alternating current through it that then shakes the solenoid and shakes it and it creates an alternating magnetic field and tar starts a car. So an electric field going in a circular motion creates a magnetic field. Likewise, if you take a magnetic field, a fixed magnet, a fixed magnet that has a magnetic field like, a, like an iron magnet or a bar magnet, and then you spin it, it will create an electric field. That's part of the way that we get electricity out of uh, hydroelectric dams. You create fixed large bar magnets that then as the water goes over the waterfall, it turns turbines and the turbines then spin magnets which, are, which, are, which wrap around coils of, 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 of wire and those wires then have an electric current that is created out of them by the, tur by the twisting, tur by the spinning magnetic field. Wow, so there's a link between the electric, the motion of an electric field and the creation of a magnetic field, and the motion of a magnetic field and the creation of an electric field. Well, we've just learned that when you vibrate an atom, you create an electric field. You always have an electric field, but if you vibrate an atom, then it creates a disturbance in the electric field. That disturbance is called a photon. But if you have it, but the fo but remember you're accelerating it, and you then have if you have any kind of motion that can be determined to be cyclic with respect to an electric field, then there is a perpendicular magnetic field to that. So it is predicted that the, that the photon has a magnetic field that runs perpendicular to the electric field in the direction of propagation. So as the, magnetic, as the photon propagates, maybe with a direction with a, with a wavelength like that going in that direction, it will also have a magnetic field that goes this way as it propagates in that direction. So electromagnetic fields, magnetic fields are linked to electric fields. 
For the earth, that is another example, the earth is a, has a liquid metal iron core, and as the earth spins, that magnetic, that liquid iron core has a strong magnetic property because of ferromagnetism, and that creates an electric field, which then creates a magnetic field, and we have a dynamo effect, and thus the earth has a, protect, a protective magnetic field around it. Really quite interesting. So magnetic fields are created by the movement of current, and the movement of current creates magnetic fields, and they're linked. All right. And that's the nature of a photon, is that oscillating electric fields create magnetic fields, and the same thing, an oscillating magnetic field creates an electric field. And as that propagates through time, we call that a photon as well. So the wave packet of a photon isn't just an electric field, there's also a magnetic field component to it as well. Um, so the direction that we call that magnetic field is called polarization. So there might, the, the photon might be oriented up and down, the electric field, might, the vibration might be like this because of how we shook the proton, it might be going like this. And so the orientation, the polarization of the light might be in that direct, might be up and down. This is also a reason why when you wish to have good sunglasses for the summertime and you wish to see the road while you're driving, you use polarized sunglasses. Because when light reflects off the road, it reflects off of a flat surface, and when it reflects off a flat surface, it bounces off that flat surface, and all the vertical components of the polarization are gone from the scattered or randomly oriented light in its polarizations to only having the ones that are parallel to the road. So all you need to do to have good glasses to drive with, which are called polarizing sunglasses, is to have something that blocks out the light that goes like this. And how can you do that? Not too difficult. You think of a picket fence. Picket fences, you can throw a frisbee through on its edge because the slats are vertical, and so there's a hole that's vertical between the slats, and you can't throw a frisbee between the slats of a picket fence. However, you can throw it on the angle, uh, throw it when it's at the, on the side through the picket fence, but not flat through the picket, through, through the picket fence. Well, if you want to change, if then they take that principle aside, so a polariz polarizing sunglasses are simply very small slats that are printed inside the glass that then block the light and how can you see it through it? Because the size of the slots is on the, side, is on the order of the size of the wavelength of light. And so the polarized light, it's coming up and down, it's going side to side, is blocked because all the slats are vertical. So you get to see only the vertically oriented light, which is minimized because of the reflective property of the asphalt. So light comes as polarized as well as being as well as being electromagnetic and it has an orientation to the electric field, an orientation to the magnetic field, 90 degrees to the electric field, it has a direction of motion at the speed of light that we talked about. So what is light? Light gets emitted in copious quantities by hot objects, by electric fields that are being made, by vibrating electrons and protons inside of atoms and molecules, inside of dense objects or inside of hot objects or inside of, uh, inside of things that are simply uh, energy and they re we see that energy coming off of them. So the light's really there and it's all sorts of different frequencies and it's all sorts of different wavelengths from very, very high energy to very low energy and how it propagates from one medium to another, whether it can penetrate a wall or penetrate only air, or whether it gets absorbed by water, or whether it gets absorbed by nothing and passes through everything, is all dependent on the properties of the material through which it passes. So light is everywhere. It bounces around the room, knocking about. And as it hits a wall, it reflects off. How does it reflect off a wall? It goes a little bit in, and it shakes the electron inside of there, and the electron says, no, I don't think I'll need that sandwich today, and shakes back, and the, uh, the photon comes back out. So really what happens in a reflection is it goes in and gets turned around. You can think of it as getting trapped in a, in a turnstile. Uh, the light gets pulled in and swung around. It doesn't actually, it gets absorbed very briefly and then re-radiated back out the same direction it came. And these kind of ray tracings were done by Newton a long time ago, so we have predictions, and in fact, quantum electrodynamics actually accurately predicts by, by some really interesting arguments that I'll leave to Richard Feynman, if you go look up at his videos about this, exactly how that works, which is really fascinating. Um, you can look that stuff up. This is not really for an introductory level thing, but you look up a quantum electrodynamics and it'll tell you exactly how 
the nature of the phase shift of the frequency of light interacts with the phasing with how the electrons move inside of uh, inside of a material so it's a very I, I won't be able to do it justice in a short video so I'll just leave it to uh, to others who have done that which are Richard Feynman videos go look his stuff up it'd be fantastic you'll love it um, but be that as it may, the study of how light actually interacts with material is an incredibly important element to all of astronomy and all of physics. Um, in fact, it's central the, because one of our more key ways of understanding the nature of materials in physics is actually through spectroscopy. All right. So let's finish with the electromagnetic spectrum. The electromagnetic spectrum is the, all the possible wavelengths of light. There are many different wavelength regions, from radio to infrared to microwave to visible to ultraviolet to x-ray to gamma ray, and they span an enormous number of wavelengths and frequencies. The total number of wavelengths that we call infrared is, is, is I think, about almost a thousand times bigger than what we call visible light. And radio light is pretty much everything shorter and longer than like a centimeter or so. Uh, ultraviolet light is shorter than 300 nanometers and goes down to a few tens of nanometers when we get into soft X-rays. And soft X-rays go up to uh, go up to angstrom level, go up to single angstrom uh, sizes, uh, and even harder when you talk to gamma rays, which are on the size scale of 10 to the minus 12 meters in terms of wavelength. So. The higher the energy of the light, the shorter the wavelength and the higher the frequency. And there's no real theoretical limit to the low, lower limit to the wavelength of light, but there is kind of a theoretical upper limit to the total energy of light that can occur in terms of energy because at a certain point the light becomes so energetic that it can actually fall apart and become other particles, like it actually can just turn into matter if the energy is great enough and that's a study for nuclear physics. So the electromagnetic spectrum is simply all the different forms of light in all their different wavelengths, but the total amount of light and different kinds of light that exist in the electromagnetic spectrum is vast. And it's the best way to, the best analogy for it is, look at the, key, the keys on a, on a grand piano, and if we could only look at the sky in visible light, like we had for centuries, all the way up through, the, night, uh, the early 1960s, when we finally got the technology to look in radio light, and when we finally launched satellites to actually go look in ultraviolet and gamma ray and x-ray and infrared, the analogy is almost completely accurate that looking at the light, looking at the universe with only one in the visible range is like playing a piano concerto uh, by only listening to one middle C, one note middle C on the piano. And that's what it's like. So imagine hearing a gorgeous symphony and somebody, some crazy composer says, well, this is a symphony, this is, this is so-and-so symphony, but I've removed all of the notes except for middle C. And so you might hear this 25 minute, um, Kikop, you might hear this wonderful piano concerto that lasts for half an hour and all you ever hear is when they play middle C. That's what it's like. Almost, you're missing the whole thing if you don't see in these other wavelengths of light. So the electromagnetic spectrum ca uh, looks at so many look at things and we get to see so many more things, so many different processes that occur as a result of it. And what are those processes? That's what we'll talk about next time. See you soon.